Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we're going to be talking about learning to live again after loss today. And uh, we've got a wonderful woman on who writes for Open to Hope and who is a, a great writer. And she is going to tell all of you about her story and how she learned to live again after loss. So Heidi, you want to introduce our guest? Sure, Mom. So our guest today is Faith Wilcox. Faith is a bereaved parent who has coped and found hope and survival in the face of tragedy. She is the author of the award-winning book, Hope is a Bright Star, a Mother's Memoir of Love, Loss, and Learning to Live Again. She is also the author of a book of poetry called Facing into the Wind, a Mother's Healing After the Death of Her Child. Welcome to the show, Faith. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. It's, it's great to have you on. And as I said to you before the show started, uh, your book, you're such a good writer. Did you write before your, your daughter died? I didn't, I didn't really write before my daughter died. No, I've always been interested in communications, but not as not um, in terms of writing a memoir. I haven't done that before. Talk a little bit about your daughter's death. She had uh, bone cancer, a rare form. Yes, my daughter had a rare form of bone cancer. And part of the process, um, she had an, an enormous amount of, of treatments over 11 months, and it was a very, very grueling process. But part of what I try to hold on to is also her wisdom that she imparted to me and the compassion that she had for other people on the floor. She would go into um, other pediatric rooms and say, hi, I'm Elizabeth. And she would explain to them processes and surgeries and procedures in a way that a child could understand. And she became like a greeter for the floor. And doctors and nurses would come up to me later and parents and parents would say, I had so much fear before we started here, but just seeing Elizabeth's smiling face and the way that she explained things to my daughter really, really helped us. Now she had a sister, Olivia, right? Yes, absolutely, yes. And, and she was 13 when she passed away, is that right? My daughter had just turned 14, my daughter Elizabeth, 14. and her older sister was just 15. Wow, so Heidi, you can identify to that sibling loss, right? Absolutely, and you know, teenage years are difficult in the best of situations. And not only did your daughter lose her sister, but she lost her only sibling too. That mm -hmm. is right. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a lot. Talk about after uh, your daughter passed away, what did the family look like at that point? You were in the process of breaking up. Your daughter had just lost a sibling. You are thinking about where you're going to live, what you're going to do. I was very, very fortunate. After I decided to leave my then husband, I went to live with my sister, Susie. And I had so much support from her and so much support from my extended community and also from her community as well. So it made, it made those 11 months possible on my own. I think it would have been just very, very hard. And Susie did very practical things too, not only feeding us day and night, but she drove my daughter Olivia to high school every day and arranged for rides for her to come home um, at the end of the day. So I had a really amazing support system and I find that during the time of an illness, people, some people who you don't even know very well will reach out to you and will be extraordinarily kind. And I had friends who would do some very practical things, which helped me a lot. One friend spent almost every Friday night that Elizabeth was hospitalized with her, and it allowed me to go home and spend the night in my home, which was an enormous help. Now, now family, tell me when, when you, I know we gain friends and we lose some friends also. There's some people who don't show up in the way 
that we expected him to. Family members also, uh, example, your ex-husband did not show up in the way that you had hoped that he would. Really, that's very true. And it really was only my ex-husband who couldn't, for some reason, who couldn't really show up in this time of great tragedy. And my, my friends were solid and my community was, came up with ideas that I didn't even know about. They, they started a, a fund to help me to cover uncovered medical costs. I mean, they just yeah. reached out and started to do some things that I, I didn't even, I didn't even know was, was being instigated. Now, one of the yeah. things that I'll, I'll say when I hear you talk about all that people did for you, you could also accept it. it it's hard for some people to accept um, that kind of help. They've been used to being the one who's given. They must have seen that you were open to this. Absolutely. I was very open to this because I think a lot of people really cared about my family and cared about our future. And I was, I was just really nurtured al along the way by them. Mm -hmm. And your sister, you were willing to go and live with her. I did the same when my husband uh, died a year and a half ago. I went and lived with my sister for a year mm -hmm. or, um, you know, for, I don't know, six months. And it, it's really wonderful to have somebody with you and in the same house, I, as I, I would put it. I, well, yeah. and I think, Mom, it's, it speaks to the significance of siblings. And we're talking about sisters here which is fairly ironic because Olivia lost her sister, but it was your sisters that you both leaned on during, you know, the biggest adversity and losses in your lives. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic. It just shows the importance of siblings and why sibling loss is such a significant loss as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you do talk a little bit about the fact that Olivia did have some problems after her uh, sibling died. And I, I even confronted you with why didn't you get divorced before she died? It was a very, very difficult time. And I, you can look back and say that I, I probably should have left my husband before, but it was a very, very big decision for me to make to go out on my own with two young girls. And eventually I did make that decision. And I found that it, it was obviously challenging for Olivia because now her father was not in the picture very often. And we didn't have, you know, the, the family of four after Elizabeth died, we really, both Olivia and I were in a maelstrom of grief. And we, and we grieved differently sometimes. Elizabeth, uh, Olivia was only 15, and often this is a tumultuous time for a teen as well. And to, and to go back to school and to try to see life as normal was a very, very hard thing for her to do. But she did her best that she could. With me, she was often angry. I think what happened is she pushed a lot of, pushed me away a lot because Anger, in a way, is an easier emotion to project than mm -hmm. sorrow. And I think part of her was underneath, maybe really worried if she really let into her sorrow that she might just drown in sorrow. Fortunately, we did have times that we grieved together. And those times I still remember and were very, very meaningful. And now she's in a much better place. It's taken a long time, but she's in a much better place in mm -hmm. terms of her confidence and her life and the joy that she has in her life. Mm -hmm. So Heidi, what's your thought on listening to that? Oh, so many things. I think Faith, you're a, a voice for a lot of parents out there that have teenagers. You know, like I said, I did my doctoral dissertation on the significance of losing a teen when you're a teenager. And, you know, our parents are safe people for us to project our anger at. You know, losing, nobody wants to lose their sister or their sibling, and especially, you don't wanna be different as a teenager. You know, you almost feel abandoned and angry because it's not the life you wanted. You don't wanna be in a grieving family. You don't wanna have a sister that's dead. I mean, all these things and being a teenager is hard in the best of times. So I think that the way that Olivia responded is pretty normal. And I think what you said is right on. It's better, it's easier to have anger 
then because angry anger is powerful it's strong it gives us energy but what's underneath that the sadness and you know the despair that feels very overwhelming and a scary place to go so i'm glad you were there for her and i know you you had to take on a lot but uh and that like you said our te the teenagers that we that they move through that and end up becoming you know getting older and learning how to navigate their grief I know that uh, Olivia has got a particular challenge right now because I've talked to my friends who are only children, as it were, only living children. They feel a huge responsibility to their parents. Yes, that's very true as well. Yeah. And I try to say that she's not responsible for me. I'm remarried. I'm doing well in my life. And, and she's well going well forward with her life too. At the Compassionate Friends, a lot of the siblings that I know are only children now. And what they've done is they've, they've chosen, they've, they have siblings that they've chosen. You know, they have friends that have become like siblings to them. And they're, they're more represented, I think, in compassionate friends and other people because they don't have any living siblings. So they kind of go there to meet other siblings that are in the same situation and now have connected, you know, as a chosen family. I think that's very true. Some of her closest friends, especially in college, um, were people who had had a big loss in their life. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they might have been an only child, or maybe not, but they had all experienced a very big loss, like the loss of a parent. And I think they immediately bonded because they understood what, what grieving, deep grieving is, is like. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you about narrative, uh, about writing, about it. I know you teach this. Uh, talk a little bit about where you teach and the benefits of writing your story and telling it. Absolutely. There's actually been a lot of research that has been done on the benefits of writing. There's a researcher named James Pennebaker who has written many books about expressive writing. And what he does is he talks to two groups of people, one group of people, and they might, they're people who usually have had some sort of trauma. For example, they might be veterans or they might be college students who have had some sort of trauma, or they might be going through cancer treatments. One group of people writes and the other group of people does not write. And again and again, he has found that the people who write have better psychological outcomes than the people who didn't write. And I've also read some articles on the Critical Care Nurse magazine about studies that have been done for people who have been in ICUs, um, pediatric intensive care units, and neonatal intensive care units. And the same theory applies. The people who did the writing, there might be parents or could be caregivers who, who chose to do the writing of even as small as 15 minutes a day, had better sense of well being. And I think what happens is one can write down your hopes and your dreams, but you can also write down your anxieties and your fears. And you can write down what medical treatments are going to be coming up and then being able to go back and ask the doctor and nurse because information is coming at you fast and furiously. And sometimes you just can't absorb it all. So if you have the opportunity to write something down, it can be extremely helpful. And so again and again, I have found that people who write when they're undergoing extreme stress have found it very um, cathartic, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I've been working with um, children and parents at Mass General Hospital for Children, where I started a journal writing program. And I go and I meet with the parents and the older children, and I discuss the benefits of writing in a journal. And I also bring writing prompts, which might be prompts from phrases from books, or they might be sort give, of- Give us a couple of prompts that you use for somebody who's recently had a family member die. What would some of the prompts be? What I do is I actually don't focus on the death. I focus on their life. So sometimes I ask if they can remember like the very happiest vacation that they had, okay. who in their support system would they go to if they had a problem? 
who in their community would be supportive of them. Um, and then sometimes people find they just want to be creative. And so if you start with a stanza from perhaps a poem, then that can get their mind going in a certain direction. And then I just tell them to just write, keep pen to paper and keep going. And then things will unfold that they might not even know that they were trapped inside and they're able to get them out. And it's very, very beneficial. That's interesting. I was thinking you could even write a limerick or fairy tale or whatever, and it would probably be surprised at what it would relate. I know when I've written some uh, things and gone back and read them, one of the things that comes up for me is how far I've come. Because Absolutely. we do keep, yes. keep progressing along and along and we don't even know it when we're in those moments of despair. And it's kind of amazing. Well, tell us uh, where people can get your books and uh, we can read your articles on Open to Hope. And uh, where can we get your books? Yes, my book's available on um, Amazon. It's, it's Hope is a Bright Star, a mother's memoir of love, loss, and learning to live again. It's also available through your local independent bookstore. You just simply have to ask for it and they can order it through different publishing services. Uh, it's available as an audio book as well. And Facing into the Wind, A Mother's Healing After the Death of a Child is a book of poetry and that's available on Amazon. Well, thank you so much for being on today, Faith, and for all the wonderful things you've done in honor of your daughter and all the great things that you do to help others. Thank you very, very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Faith. And I love your name because <laughs> you are giving us faith that there is hope again and you are a great example of that. Thank you. Thank you. And Heidi and I, thank you all for coming on to the show today. And we want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.